Hey everyone, welcome back to another Blueprint Nursing NCLEX review video. My name is Nicole, and I'm happy you're here. Today we're going to review an important safety topic, restraints. Restraints are an intricate part of nursing. They're an extremely important resource, and it is crucial that we know when and how to use them appropriately. A restraint is an external restriction of the client's freedom of movement with or without their permission. The use of restraints is a temporary measure that is meant to ensure the safety of the client or others. Restraints should always be used after all other options are exhausted and for the shortest amount of time possible. Let's review common types that you may see when you're a real deal nurse. Belt or body restraint. This is a belt that secures to the bed. The client can sit or lie down in a supine position with the restraint placed at their waist. Okay, quick question. What may be a risk that is specific to the application of this restraint? Let's think. The belt is secured at the waist. But what if it is applied improperly or the client's position in the restraint changes? This client could have a belt around their chest instead of their waist and experience difficulty breathing. You got it. Elbow immobilizer. An elbow immobilizer is a rigidly padded sleeve that slides over the elbow and immobilizes the elbow joint. These are generally used to prevent damage to intravenous lines and other medical devices on the body. Mitten restraint. A mitten restraint is a hand covering that has a cushion pad under the palm and a mesh cover on top. Soft limb restraint. This restraint is generally used on wrists or ankles. It is a padded cuff fixed by Velcro. Where would you secure this type of restraint? Pause here, come back when you're ready. You got it? Yeah, that's right. Secure the restraint to the bed, not the side rail. We don't want the restraint to move when we adjust a side rail. The restraint must also be secured with a quick release knot in case of an emergency. So, we know it is important to move from least to most invasive interventions with our clients. Here are some measures that we can try as alternatives to restraints. Of course, this is where our clinical judgment comes in. Use these interventions if appropriate. We can offer diversional activities, try to remove agitating stimuli as soon as possible, Examples of external stimuli may be those bright fluorescent hospital lights or a beeping IV pump. Using trained sitters or using de-escalation techniques. De-escalation techniques are a way to address client behavior in a respectful, empathetic, and non-judgmental manner. They can make a big difference in the safety of clients and staff. Okay, let's talk about the indications for restraint use because they must be clinically justified. What does that mean? Well. We have to have a client that is a risk to themselves or others, and we must have exhausted all other options prior to restraints. So we can't put our client who is a fall risk in restraints without trying bed alarms, frequent needs assessments, or a one-to-one -one sitter first. Let's review a few indications for restraints that you may see in practice. A client with aggressive or violent behavior. I would include risk of harm to self or others here a risk of attempting to remove lines or medical devices, cognitive impairment that leads to unsafe behaviors, and medical procedures that require limited movement. All right, we have a client that may need or a client that is in restraints. Let's talk about some nursing interventions that are related to restraint use. Trying alternatives to restraints first. Remember, we wanna work from least to most invasive interventions. Frequent monitoring. Clients in restraints should be monitored every 15 minutes for violent clients and every two hours for nonviolent clients. So what are we monitoring on this client? Well, we're monitoring a lot of things. Let's break it down. We'll get vital signs, do a focused assessment on the area the restraint is applied to. This is including integrity of the skin under the restraint, circulation, sensation, and range of motion. The client's personal needs, such as hygiene, illumination, nutrition, and hydration, since these clients can't do this independently. Lastly, we would complete a behavioral assessment to determine the cause and need for restraint. Evaluation of safety interventions. We should always be evaluating the client's response to restraint and if the restraints are still the most appropriate safety measure. Review of facility-specific policies. The provider's orders must be current within the last 24 hours of the restraint application with face-to-face -face assessment in a timely manner. We also need to document the restraints according to the facility's policies. Create an environment that the client will feel comfortable in. What does a comfortable environment look like to you? Well, 
We can orient the clients to the environment to make sure they understand their surroundings and provide supportive measures like a comfortable room temperature. Restraints are a safety tool that can quickly turn unsafe for the client and staff. Let's review common safety concerns and complications. Injury or complications related to immobilization. These can occur when the restraint is too tight to the point of completely restricting movement or when range of motion exercises are not performed. Injury related to improperly applied restraints. Be sure to check your work after application. Psychological distress or trauma. Be aware that the use of restraints can be traumatizing for clients and staff. The client may feel humiliated, agitated, or depressed because we have reduced their autonomy. We should provide emotional support and again, remove restraints as soon as possible. There is a red flag that I do want to mention here. The power imbalance between a nurse and a client in restraints is huge. Please be mindful of any evidence of misuse or abuse with restraints. Know who to speak to when advocating for a client that is suspected of improper restraint use. We'll want to inform clients and their families about their reasons for restraints. It can be scary for a client and their family when restraints are applied. The best thing we can do is to keep them informed about what to expect and what the goal of restraint use is. Do you know what the goal of restraint use is? To discontinue the restraints. We want to promote a restraint-free environment whenever possible. Okay, are you ready for a question to test your knowledge of restraints? Let's do it. The nurse and unlicensed assistive personnel are caring for a client in restraints. Which of the following tasks would be inappropriate for the nurse to assign to UAP? Option one, assessing the client's skin under the restraint. Option two, assisting the client with voiding. Option three, releasing a soft limb restraint for range of motion exercises. Option four, repositioning the client's position every two hours. Pause here and come back when you're ready. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. Delegating a skin assessment to an unlicensed assistive personnel would be inappropriate. While a UAP can report a change in skin condition to their nurse, they cannot formally assess the client's skin. Delegating assistance with voiding, range of motion exercises, and repositioning are all tasks that fall under the UAP's scope of practice. I know, we threw a little delegation twist in there, but I knew you can do it. All right, that's it. We reviewed the topic of restraint use. I am so glad you were able to join me. Don't forget to subscribe so you can catch all our videos. Also, check out our self-paced crash course and live study group options. See you next time.